afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the introduction. So my name is Hanya. Um, I'm an academic clinical fellow in oral surgery based at the School of Dentistry in Sheffield, and I've been working closely with my supervisor, Dr. Kurram, and Professor Rajput and his team here um, to um, investigate the application of AI for automated segmentation of oral epithelium. So for the course of this presentation, I'd like to talk about oral dysplasia, what it is, how it's conventionally diagnosed, and why this proves to be such a diagnostic challenge amongst histopathologists. I'd also like to talk about the clinical importance of this research in relation to patient care and patient outcomes, and I'll present the preliminary results of our pilot study. So oral epithelial dysplasia is a diagnostic term which is used to describe a chronic progressive premalignant disorder affecting the oral cavity. It's the precursor to oral squamous cell carcinoma, which is amongst the top 10 most common cancers in the world. Unfortunately, it has an increasing incidence and a worsening prognosis, and every year there are almost half a million new cases of oral cancer diagnosed in the world. Sadly, over the past two decades, there has been a rise by 68% in the UK alone for oral cancer incidence rates, and despite medical advancement, patient outcome and prognosis is very poor, with a less than 50% five-year survival rate. So it's extremely important that oral precancer is detected and managed early. Oral dysplasia, as you can see from the clinical photos, has a variable clinical presentation. It can present as a um, chronic white patch or a red patch, or it can appear as a mixed white-red lesion. It can also have a papillary or a verrucous or an ulcerative appearance, and there are a number of different risk factors that can be associated with it. Genetics plays a role, but also various social habits, such as smoking, excessive alcohol intake, um, and tobacco use in betel nut and, and palm chewing as well. Sadly, 30 to 80% of these can progress to malignancy, and so early detection and treatment is important because almost 70% of these can be prevented. Conventional oral dysplasia grading is achieved by histological analysis from a tissue sample obtained from a biopsy of the lesion. Initially, um, the epithelium may undergo surface thickening, and if exposed to certain irritants and carcinogens, the cells can undergo cytological atypia um, and genetic alterations to form dysplasia. There are three different grades of dysplasia. So mild dysplasia can progress to moderate, and moderate can progress to severe. And if left unmanaged, this can develop into a cancer. If the irritant or the causative agent is removed, to some extent, the dysplasia grade can be reversed in the early stages of grading. You can see, based on the histology there, the, the varying appearances um, in relation to the different grades, which are based on the different architectural features and the extent to which these progress through the oral epithelium. So there are two different types of classification systems to grade oral dysplasia, uh, but the gold standard, uh, which we've used for the purpose of our pilot study, is the World Health Organization criteria, which demonstrates over 15 different features that can be observed histologically to grade dysplasia. But in addition to these features, it's also based on the extent to which these features present through the different layers of the epithelium. So in mild dysplasia, you can see from the black dotted line that it, it's normally, the architectural changes are normally confined to the lower third of the epithelium. In moderate dysplasia, they may extend to two-thirds of the thickness of the epithelium, and in severe dysplasia, beyond two-thirds. And the cytological changes that you see generally progress and are more marked as the dysplasia grade um, progresses. Now, for pathologists, it might be easier to differentiate between mild and severe dysplasia, but it is much harder to differentiate between mild moderate and moderate to severe. And as a result of the, the varying different features that can be noted, there is wide inter-observer variability. Unfortunately, this can have significant clinical implications for patient care because the grade of dysplasia is used to determine the treatment which is offered to a patient and also the level of surveillance for that particular lesion. And so there is a clinical need to develop a standardised and objective method to eliminate this subjective analysis and enable early precancer detection. We know that AI is growing in popularity 
and has been widely applied to aid diagnosis and prediction of cancers, um, and that's been mentioned um, throughout the course of the day. We know artificial intelligence is important in obtaining big data from whole slide images. So using this concept, um, I'd like to present our pilot study, um, which is um, based around automated oral epithelial segmentation. So how did we carry out this study? We initially identified varying grades of oral dysplasia from the tissue archive database um, in the oral maxillofacial pathology department um, in Sheffield. And this included mild, moderate, severe, as well as normal and also cancerous epithelium. New sections were then cut and stained with H&E and these were scanned into digital whole slide images. Five-year clinical follow-up data was collected to identify which of these cases had transformed into a cancer and also to identify the different risk factors for the patients. And the whole slide images were then graded and meticulously labelled and annotated using the virtual slide marker software um, developed by the computer science department here in Warwick. So the different whole slide images were segmented into regions of clinical significance, these being the different layers of epithelium to include keratin, epithelium and basement membrane, as well as non-regions of interest. And then local and global features were extracted from these segmented areas to help train the deep neural network. So for patch extraction, um, for layer segmentation, we obtained... Um, pixel patches measuring 256 by 256 at magnification times 20. And the software that was used to train the deep neural network was Deep Lab V3, which has a good history of image analysis for histology. Our initial pilot data set included 30 whole slide images for the training set, five for the validation set, and three for the test set. So, after training, incorporating the original image with ground truth, we were able to predict the different layers of epithelium. You can see the original image, which is a tissue sample obtained from the cheek. And this test image demonstrates prediction um, quite confidently of the different layers, which are overlaid in the original image in red, green, and purple, identifying the keratin, epithelium, and basement membrane. Again, we have another sample, which is also obtained from the cheek. And again, you can quite clearly see um, the different layers which have been overlaid on the original image. Our validation accuracy for the different layers um, was greater than 90% for keratin, epithelium, and basal layer, which is quite promising. Next, we'll look at the prediction of the percentage area and also the width of each of these layers for each grade of dysplasia. You can see from these scatter graphs um, the keratin layer, epithelium and basal layer for mild, moderate and severe dysplasia cases and the general trends that can be observed. We can see for both moderate and severe dysplasia, the basal layer percentage area was greater than for mild dysplasia. And in some of the moderate dysplasia cases, the keratin layer also had a greater percentage area. Similarly, you can see the mean width, which was calculated from the medial axis of the layer, which again was greater for the basal layer in the moderate and severe cases. And this is consistent with what we might expect to see histologically. Um, some of the architectural features, such as formation of the reed pegs and loss of epithelial cohesion, which may explain why this was the case um, for a greater width in the uh, higher grades of dysplasia. Next, we'll look at the percentage area and the width of the layers between the transformed and non-transformed cases. So from our cohort, there were 10 cases which had transformed. Six of these were from the moderate uh, dysplasia grades and the remaining from severe dysplasia. And again, you can see that the uh, percentage area of the basal layer was greater in the transformed cases. The width of the basal layer in the transformed cases was also greater in comparison to the non-transformed cases. And again, this is consistent with what we would expect to see and demonstrates one of the architectural features that we would note um, in transformed or high dysplasia grades um, histologically. 
So to summarise, um, our deep learning based um, automated segmentation has demonstrated a promising um, um, ability to be able to predict and distinguish between the different oral epithelial layers in the different grades of dysplasia and also early ability to be able to detect more precise architectural changes as well. Currently, we're in the process of expanding our cohort to further train the AI algorithm. And we hope through this we'll be able to aid detection of the relationship between the different layers and also to identify other local architectural features to be able to assign a global dysplasia grade to that case. I'd like to acknowledge Professor Rajput and also uh, members of his team who've helped with the technical side of this project. I'm sure they're happy to take some questions on the technical side, but um, um, I'll do my best as well. Thank you. Working from the clinical side, when you look at the artificial intelligence results or through this work, what kind of interesting things did you observe? What did you learn? Um, I think one of the interesting things based on the results we looked at was um, the fact that we were able to identify specific and precise um, local features that are consistent with what we might see in dysplasia histologically as well. So when I mentioned the greater width of the basal layer in the higher grades of dysplasia and also in the transformed cases, that could represent the formation of reed pegs, which we know is one of the, the features observed uh, based on our WHO criteria. So that's uh, quite promising. So when you report the results of the width, you just show a single value, the mean value, presumably, of the width of each layer. Did you look at the exactly. variability of the layers? So, I mean, if it varies a lot from one point to another, does that have any, any significance? Um, and we looked at the standard deviation um, of the width of each layer. Unfortunately, that's not been uh, presented. Um, and we found similar results, the significance mainly being basal layer, as I've mentioned, um, was significant, um, particularly in the higher grades of dysplasia.